Okay, let's get started. So this class, we're going to continue our class on the fundamentals of environmental engineering and science. And this class, we're going to focus on the ecosystems. So before we introduce the contents of this class, let's again do a recap of our last class. So basically, last class, we talked about the material and energy balances, right? We want to understand what is the general mass balance equation, and how do we determine the performance of the batch, plug flow, and completely mixed reactors? And also, we compared the efficiencies for each of this uh, reactor. And we want to know which type of the reactor is more efficient. And also, what is the reason for that? We found that the plug flow reactor is more efficient. And this is mainly because the reactant concentration at the beginning is not reduced, which means that the reaction rate is faster at the initial time. And this is going to give us a higher or a faster reaction rate. So this, this class, um, basically, we're going to introduce the ecosystems. And first, let's do a, or let's watch a short video from YouTube. Basically, this introduces how a human introduced, or what is the effect of the wolves that's helping us to maintain the balance of the ecosystems. I don't know. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. That the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park. And despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. 
And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transform not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. So from this video, we saw that how we introduce the uh, wolves into the natural system can affect the ecosystem, right? This is being, um, there is a systematic effect, both on the food chain and also even on the geology, okay? So this class, we're going to focus on the ecosystems. And the course objectives are first, know what are, what are the impact of the human activity on the natural world and also learn how this work is, world is being operated, especially understand the important nutrient cycles. So, what are ecosystems? An ecosystem is short for ecological system. So basically, an ecological system is a living system that includes um, plants, animals, and microorganisms. For example, an ecosystem can be lakes, rivers, forests, lands, or even constructed wetlands. So here I'm showing a very famous painting, and some of you might know that this is, um, the name of this painting is called Water Lilies, and it's painted by Monet, a famous painter during the 19th century, okay? So you can see that water lilies live in an ecosystem, which is a lake. And in this lake, or in this ecosystem, system, you can also find other players. For example, the grass, the, grass, the trees, right? And also there are fish below the lake or in the lake. And also there are microorganisms. So you can see that we actually are painting these ecosystems from very old time. So if you look at this question, what are included in the eco ecosystem? And you can see that it actually includes all of these above, right? So what is the human impact on the ecosystem? So human can impact or can influence the ecosystem from many aspects. For example, the agriculture, oper uh, agriculture operation can significantly influence the ecosystems. And it is the most significant source of lake and river pollution. Because during the fertilization, we generate a lot of organics. And also, these nutrients can be passed by precipitation or by rainfall and flow into the lake and the rivers. And also, there can be pesticides from the agriculture operations. And from the power production, we know that the coal-fired power plants can generate a large amount of carbon dioxide because carbon is a major composition of these fossil fuels. They can also generate NOx, which are short for uh, nitrogen oxides, so, uh, sulfur dioxide. It can also generate particles and metals. And in, inside the power production, the hydroelectric power can also influence the ecosystem. For example, we talk about the dams quite a lot. And then the dams are actually detrimental to the river ecosystems because it can lead to er erosion and also landslides. And furthermore, the industrialization of the human being actually generates a lot of air, wastewater, and industrial wastes. And furthermore, the introduction of the non-native species can also harm the ecosystem. And furthermore, we're going to understand the mass and or energy and mass flow inside these ecosystems. So here we're going to introduce several types of living creatures. Okay? So basically, we're going to divide them based on whether they are going to sustain themselves and also what type of energy they are going to uh, sustain themselves based on okay so we can so ba basically based on whether a living creature or a living organism can sustain itself we can divide them into autotrophs
and heterotrophs. Okay, so also based on what type of energy it uses, we can divide them into phototrophs. and chemotrophs. Okay, so basically the troph here means the nutrient, okay, means the food, the source of the food. So the autotrophs can sustain itself. It doesn't need to rely on, or it doesn't need to survive on other creatures. While the heterotrophs have to live or have to survive based on the autotrophs or other types of the heterotrophs. And the phototrophs means that this creature or this uh, uh, living organism can utilize the solar energy to convert that into the food or into the energy. While the chemotroph means that this living creature can convert the chemistry or the chemical energy into its food. Okay, And because of that, we know that the plants are the photoautotrophs because they're utilizing the solar or the sunlight as the energy source, and also they can sustain themselves, okay? So the plants are also called the primary producers because they're basically utilizing the primary energy, which is the sunlight. And these plants actually use the sunlight and the inorganic carbon, which are carbon dioxide, to produce the organic materials. And also, we can define a parameter, a different term called the net primary productivity, NPP, which is the rate of the organic material being produced. So based on this, uh, based on this def definition, we can also find there are some photoheterotrophs. So these photoheterotrophs means that um, they're utilizing solar energy, but they're living based on other creatures or other materials, especially the organic matter. Okay, so these are some bacteria that are newly found in the ocean. Basically, they use the sunlight as an energy source, but also uses organic matter as their carbon source. And further, uh, we can draw out this trophic levels, which is also a uh, more uh, more simplified version of the food chain. So basically the phototrophs or the autotrophs are going to add the first level of this trophic level, right? So they can convert the inorganic carbon and sunlight into energy, okay? And they can further consume, can be consumed or can be eaten by the heterotrophs. And these heterotrophs, for example, the human being or some uh, animals, sheep uh, or cows who are living based on the grass or the plants we can also call them as their uh, herbivores, okay? So they are converting the chemical energy from the plants into their own energy. So that's why they're, um, they're part of the chemotrophs, okay? So they are converting the organic carbon, which are the chemical energy, or utilizing the chemical energy, and then to produce further energy. And there are animals that are living or dependent on, the, on these herbivores, and these are called the carnivores, for example, the wolves or the human being or eagles, right? So they didn't, because of that, these animals are also chemotrophs, chemotrophs, because they're consuming the organic carbon. They're consuming other living creatures to survive, okay? So this is basically we're at the third level of this trophic level, all right? And because of that, here we can define this, uh, we can generate this um, uh, food pyramid or the food chain. So basically, uh, the phototrophs or the phototrophs are going to utilize the solar energy and use the inorganic carbon to generate the energy. And then there are going to be some herbivores to consume these plants and then convert these organic carbon into energy. And then at the top of the, of the food pyramid, these uh, um, carnivores are going to um, survive based on these uh, herbivores, right? To, come, to further take up these organic carbon and then use that as an energy to sustain themselves. Therefore, the chemotrophs utilize the chemical energy to 
convert that into their own energy, right? So they can uh, oxidize the organic and inorganic materials to convert that into energy. And furthermore, for these uh, chemo heterotrophs, they can be divided into herbivores or carnivores, right? So herbivores are the primary consumers. We also call them as primary consumers, while the carnivores are called the secondary consumers, which are further higher up at the, at the food chain. And for these systems, about 10% of the food energy is used for synthesize or for growing or for sustaining um, the, the living creature itself. And there are also species called chemoautotrophs, if we go back to these categories here. So we introduced that there are photoautotrophs, right? The plants are these photoautotrophs. There are also photoheterotrophs, which are some bacteria we saw there. And most of the animals in the nature are chemo or are chemoheterotrophs, right? So the only one we're missing right now are the chemoautotrophs. And here actually you can see that nature indeed have these creatures, okay? So uh, these bacteria basically utilize the uh, nitrogen as their source, okay? They can, they can oxidize ammonia for energy, but use carbon dioxide as their carbon source. And for these uh, chemoautotrophs, 7.5% uh, of the energy is used for the synthesis. And we can further divide the living creatures based on the method they conduct respiration. So there are aerobic respiration, which use the molecular oxygen for respiration. For example, human being, and actually most of the animals are or utilize these aerobic respiration. So there are, there are also anoxic, anoxic respiration, which means that these living creatures, or most of them are bacteria, use nitrate or nitrite as their oxygen source. There are also anaerobic respiration, which means that these bacteria or this living creature can only live in anaerobic environment. So they and do not require the oxygen or nitrate to present. So they can use the sulfate, carbon dioxide, and organic matter to survive themselves. And there are also some type of bacteria which are called the uh, facultative bacteria. So they can survive bo both the aerobic and anaerobic conditions, which is a pretty smart way of living. And in ecosystems, we also want to understand the way that pollutant can transport so there are different terms called the bioconcentration, uh, concentra bioaccumulation, and also biomagnification. So this is based, basically based on how certain species can be transported from the lower level of the food chain to upper level of the food chain. For example, for the bioconcentration, it means the uptake from dissolved phase. So there is a bioconcentration factor in there. And as, as for the um, bioaccumulation, it means that chemicals from the food is being accumulated in the body. And in terms of biomagnification, it means that the chemicals are more and more concentrated when they move up through the food chain. So for example, here, um, it shows us the biomagnification of one pollutant called the polychlorinated um, biphenyls, which, are, uh, which we can directly call them as PCBs. So basically, this is a pollutant that people start to emit into the atmosphere because of the industrialization. And you can see that at first, when you emit it into the lakes, it's going to affect the concentration of these PCBs in these planktons, right? The concentration is also pretty low because for the phyto phytoplankton, they're at the lowest level of the food chain, right? Because they are um, photoautotrophs, right? because this means that they, they can utilize the, utilize the solar energy and also these inorganic carbon to survive themselves. So they can be eaten by these zooplanktons, but what you can also see that the concentration of the PCB increases. And then these zooplanktons are um, eaten by the smelt, and then by the lake trout, and finally by these uh, uh, dogs, right? And as you can see, the concentration of these PCB gets higher and higher when it get to, gets to the uh, uh, animals or get to the bird side, which really means that these pollutants are being magnified or being 
um, accumulated or um, concentrated at a very high concentration level there. Okay, so this is a, an example of the bell mag magnification. So in the ecosystem, it's actually composed of many cycles there, and therefore we have to know how the nutrients are, nutrients are being cycled in our atmosphere or in our world. So first, or the most important cycle, is the carbon cycle, because as you can see, all of these living creatures are based on carbon or hydrocarbons. Therefore, the carbon is a very important nu nutrient in the body of the living organisms. And as you can see, the carbon can be first accepted by the photosynthesis, or this carbon dioxide can be absorbed or can be utilized, utilized by the photosynthesis. And then uh, they can be further transformed into these organic carbon, right? And then these organic carbon can be utilized by the animals. And of course, the animals will also perish. And then um, as they perish, these organic carbon can then go back into the inorganic carbon and then further get utilized by the plants. Okay, And then uh, furthermore, um, the, uh, this oxidation of, the, uh, of these uh, dead organisms or weight products are going to release the carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. And then in this way, we can conduct this cycle here. And we should also notice that because of the industrialization, people are burning fossil fuels. Therefore, the fossil fuel combustion is another source of the carbon dioxide. Okay? And in terms of the uh, processes that collect or that absorb the carbon dioxide, the ocean will also contribute to a lo pretty large fraction. And actually, we can introduce or we can get an understanding of how large these uh, release or absorption processes or how large the scale is by, its, uh, by this picture here. So basically you can see that the ocean acts as a sink, right? So it can absorb this carbon dioxide. And further we can know that um, basically there's an ocean pump or the, there's a uh, salinity pump that uh, it's, can store this carbon, di carbon dioxide deeper in the ocean. And of course, the land can act as a sink for, through the uh, photosynthesis because it's absorbing the carbon dioxide and converting them into the organic carbon, right? So these are the major sinks of the carbon dioxide. And in terms of the major source of the carbon dioxide, you can see that the fossil fuel is a major source. And there are also land use change, which is because of the wildfires and also because of the human being basically will convert these uh, forests into uh, farmlands and then that's going to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide being absorbed by these plants okay so if you compare the levels or if you add up these things you can see that these two add up is around 20 okay but if we add up these two it's around uh, 39 okay which means that there's a net increase of the carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere, okay? So this is causing this atmospheric growth of the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So uh, basically for the carbon nutrient cycle, you can see that the carbon can exist in different forms. It can exist in the form of organics, carbon dioxide in the air, fossil fuels, and rock and soils. For example, the rocks can also contribute a large fraction of the carbon because, for example, the calcium carbonate, which is a major contribution of a lot of rocks, contains carbon inside. And, but among, for all of these sources, the, most of the carbon is in the ocean. Okay? So because the ocean is, is actively absorbing this carbon dioxide into the liquid phase. And of course, the photosynthesis is converting these carbon dioxide into the organic carbon. And after the de degradation or incineration of these plants or animals, um, they can get converted back into the carbon dioxide. And we should also mention that the primary productivity is not limited by carbon dioxide because you can see that there is an almost endless carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. It is actually limited by other nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, silicon, and other essential trace elements. And we are going to talk about these other nutrient cycles later on. But first, let's further look at the carbon cycle here. 
So for the, as we can see, there are major two sinks for the carbon dioxide or the, the carbon, okay? So one of the sink is called the solubility pump. So what happens in the solubility pump is that the dissolved carbon dioxide uh, into the ocean, especially in the cold region, has a higher density. So basically, this cold water on the surface will sink into the deeper ocean, which means that the water that contains less carbon dioxide are going to get transported to the surface of the ocean. And what this means is that you have more fresh water, and then this water can further accept or absorb the carbon dioxide. This means that the carbon dioxide will get lost in the deep waters. Okay? And there's also a pump called the biological pump, and this is a sink of the carbon dioxide from this uh, land, or from these plants here. And it, for a biological pump, it means that the algae, plants or microorganisms, and their pre predators will take up the carbon dioxide. And when they die, they will act as a sink, and they can further get stored into the land or into the ocean. And there's also the influence of the human activity because of the fossil fuel combustion, right? And also the large-scale production of these livestock and the burning of the forest. This will cause a net increase of the carbon dioxide. And as a, as a matter of fact, in the last 150 years, the carbon dioxide concentration in the air has increased by 30%. And this is a major driver for the global warming. Global warming. So here I'm showing a, um, a time series of the carbon dioxide concentration that's being measured by the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Okay? So you can see that uh, the record actually shows the, carbon, the concentration of carbon dioxide um, from 1960s to 2018, which is quite close to now. And what you can see is that there's a continuous increase of the carbon dioxide concentration at this observatory, okay? So although this is a single location, you can see that this is basically averaging, showing the data point um, every after a month or several months. And this continuous increase indeed uh, shows that there this long record, long time record measurement is showing a continuous increase of the carbon dioxide. Right? And as you can see, from 1960s to 2018, or let's say 2020, uh, 2020, which is over the course of 60 years, you can see that the carbon dioxide concentration increased by what? Almost 80 ppm. Okay? So which, is, which means that there's a 25% of the increase for the carbon dioxide concentration. So if we further look at this curve here, you can see that there is a lot of zigzags, right? The concentration seems increase uh, during uh, for a certain period of time and then decrease, increase and decrease. And each of this cycle seems to represent a whole year, okay? So can you see what happens here? And this is because, mainly because the uh, Mauna Loa Observatory is located in the northern hemisphere. This is because of the seasonal in influence. So basically during the summer of the northern hemisphere, there's going to be a stronger photosynthesis and this is going to reduce the carbon dioxide concentration. You can indeed see this influence of the biological pump here, right? And during the winter of the northern hemisphere, which means that there's a, the a summer of the uh, southern hemisphere, uh, the carbon dioxide concentration is going to increase and further, you may wonder why, because uh, there's always going to be summer and winter on both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, right? Why don't the, com the carbon dioxide concentration increase because it's the summer during the southern hemisphere? So let's say this is our planet Earth here. I'm talking about this. During the summer, the northern hemisphere is going to have a stronger photosynthesis, and then this is going to cause a decrease of the carbon dioxide. Well, during the winter of the northern hemisphere, which is the summer of the uh, southern hemisphere, the carbon dioxide concentration is going to increase. And you may wonder, why don't these two effects balance? Actually, this is mainly because if you look at a world map, there's more um, land area on the northern hemisphere, which means that the northern hem hemisphere is going to um, be the major driver for the concentration of the carbon dioxide. Okay, 
And this continuous increase of the carbon dioxide concentration is because of the human impact. Okay, so um, during our earlier lecture, we also showed that uh, on our Earth, um, the uh, carbonic acid or bicarbonate and carbonate ion is an important buffer system, right? It also applies for all of the ocean area. We we'll also mentioned that if we increase the carbon dioxide concentration, that is going to cause, basically, push this equilibrium towards this direction. And this is going to lead to a net decrease of the uh, pH. And this is in indeed what is happening in our ocean. And you can see that as time goes on from 1988 to 2010, the pH of the water or the pH of the ocean indeed decreases. And this is because more carbon dioxide is emitted into the atmosphere. You may say that this is a, just a minor decrease of the, um, of the pH, but a small decrease of the pH may lead to significant influence on the living organisms in this ocean water. For example, the photoplanktons or the zooplanktons, right? We know that these planktons are contributing a large carbon uh, sink on our Earth, and they are the main producer of the uh, carbon of the organic carbon on our Earth. Okay, so we really don't want to change the pH a lot. Okay, and further, we can look at how the carbon dioxide is affecting our climate. And here, it basically shows the temperature anomaly, starting from the 1880. Toward, to now, actually. And you can see that as time goes on, the global temperature or temperature anomaly goes, are positive, goes positive, right? Which means that there is a net warming effect happening on our Earth. But how is this related to the carbon dioxide? And further, this is mainly coming from the uh, long time measurement, or this is um, a historical record of the relationship between the carbon dioxide and the temperature. So basically what scientists do is that they uh, went to the Antarctica, and then because Antarctica is not affected by human being or human activities, so what they did is they obtained a ice column, a very long or deep ice column from the Antarctica, and try to trace what is temperature and also what is the carbon dioxide within that um, ice column. And here you can see that dating back to uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, and there is a nice trend between the carbon dioxide and the temperature. So the temperature is falling the carbon dioxide concentration very well. Whenever you have these high concentration of carbon dioxide, you're going to have a high temperature there. And see what is happening right now, okay? So for the past hundreds of years or tens of years, the carbon dioxide concentration skyrocketed, okay? And right now, the temperature, the global temperature, have not responded really well to these carbon dioxide concentration yet. But we don't know what is going to happen, right? The carbon dioxide concentration almost doubled compared to, let's say, hundreds of years ago, okay? And this is um, most likely going to lead to a global warming effect. And the global warming is not meaning that the global is getting warmer and warmer or whether it's getting hotter and hotter. We actually know that recently during the winter, the weather is not very hot there. And actually, this net global warming is leading to extreme weathers. And this is causing more temperature anomaly there. And these extreme weathers may include these hurricanes, right? The drought, right? Snow mountains, they might be um, lacking snows because of higher temperature, floods, and also really snow, strong snowstorms, okay? So we have to know that um, that is also the reason why people start to relate these climate effects of the carbon dioxide as global climate change. So we don't call the global warming anymore, although there is a net warming effect of the carbon dioxide. And mainly it's these extreme weathers or the climate change is going to be the result of these high carbon dioxide concentrations. So if we break down the carbon dioxide concentration, or the carbon dioxide emissions, where are they coming from? And they're actually mainly coming from the human activities, right? And further, you can see that the carbon dioxide concentration, carbon dioxide emission is mainly coming from these three types of fuels globally. 
And as you can see, the coal is playing a very important role in the total budget of the carbon dioxide emission. And furthermore, the oil is quite similar to coal combustion because there are more power plants that are based on oils. And the natural gas is also taking a larger share. But you can see from this trend that the global consumption of the fossil fuel or the carbon dioxide emission from these fossil combustion is keeping increasing. And because of that, we're going to emit more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and potentially lead to stronger climate change effects. And here further it shows the major countries that are emitting carbon dioxide. And as you can see, the US and China are the major carbon dioxide emitters. In recent years, China surpassed the US and became the largest carbon dioxide emitting country. Okay? But we cannot easily cut all of these carbon dioxide emissions because, as I said, the carbon dioxide emission is related to fossil fuel combustion. And fossil fuel combustion is most likely or is very closely related to the economy. We cannot just, just cut all of the economy and to reduce the carbon dioxide. So there are also large other countries, for example, Japan, India, UK, Russia. They are also major carbon dioxide emitting countries. And here is further breaking down or to try to show the influence or the, the roles of the US and China play in the carbon emitter or the carbon emission. You can see that we're indeed um, taking a really great share in terms of the carbon dioxide emission. Therefore, these two countries have to think of um, other ways, or for example, renewable energies or other techniques to remove or to reduce the carbon dioxide emission, okay? To try to rely on some more um, sustainable renew or new renewable energies. So that's all for the carbon cycle. And in terms of the nitrogen cycle, uh, it is quite similar to the carbon dioxide, except that uh, this is not as significant as the carbon dioxide as the nutrition. So the nitrogen can be emitted or can be released by precipitation because the, um, these uh, nitrogen species can actually get generated from the lightning and then they can get precipitated onto the ground. And then the plants can uh, uptake these nitrogen sources. And then after these plants uh, form dies or form the residues, these organic matter can get mineralized, uh, mineralized and form ammonium. And this ammonium can further get oxidized to form nitrates and nitrates. Okay? And basically this is, uh, and, and the, further the nitrates can get absorbed or get utilized by the plants and then further emitted into the atmosphere. So this is a general cycle for the nitrogen. And in terms of the nitrogen cycle, there are several terms or definitions we need to pay attention to. So there is a nit uh, nitrogen fixation. And this is conducted by the blue-green algae or other plants. And this means that the nitrate uptake by the algae or other plants. So it converts the nitrogen into the organic nitrogen and further they can get decom decomposed to release the, these nitrogen into the soil. So they release as ammonium and then they can get nitrification into the nitrate. And then further, they can get dentrified, or this process called dentrification, to reduce them into the nitrogen. Okay? So, for example, nitrification means the oxi oxidation of the ammonia to form these nitrate ions. And further, these nitrate ions can react with the uh, organic, mat organic um, carbon to get reduced to nitrogen. And this process is called the dentrification. So how is human interfering the nitrogen cycle? So the use of the industrial fertilizers contains a lot of these uh, nitrogen species or nitrate or ammonia species. And also the fossil fuel combustion can generate NOx into the atmosphere and they can get precipitated uh, to the ground. And also the large scale production of the nitrogen fixing crops, for example, a lot of the beans are nitrogen fixing crops. And the carbon, the the power plant can release these NOx and then form the acid rain and cause the lake acidification. So there is also 
uh, phosphorus cycle. So phosphorus cycle is also similar to the uh, nitrogen cycle, so they can get precipitated to convert into the ground. And then um, an important source of these phosphorus is coming from the rocks. Okay, so the weathering of the phosphate will generate these ions and then pass them into the lakes. And in the lakes, they can get uh, utilized by these microorganisms and then further trace back down, back into the uh, higher level of the food chain. So they can get utilized by these uh, living organisms. And for the first first cycle, we need to um, know that um, from the natural processes and also from the human activities, we can have the rock weathering the munip municipal sewage, so human activity actually generates a lot of these phosphorus um, from our daily life or from the industry. Also from phosphorus is a, also a very important element or nutrient uh, for the fertilizers. Okay, so finally is the sulfur cycle. So sulfur uh, is also affected by human activities. As I said, the fossil fuel combustion are going to generate these um, sulfur dioxide and then they, they can form the acid rain and further get um, precipitated down to the surface of the ocean. The volcanoes can generate sulfur dioxide and also the uh, hydrogen sulfide. The hydrogen sulfide can of course get oxidized into the atmosphere and further um, get precipitated to the ocean or to the land. Actually the sulfur cycle is mainly affected by the human activities and they can mainly come from these three different uh, methods, approaches. So the first one is the use of the sulfur-containing compounds as a fertilizers, because sulfur is an important element for the crops, so people use that in the fertilizers, and as these fertilizers are being run off, or being carried by the rainwater, they can get into the ecosystems. And the sulfur dioxide can be released from the power plants by co combusting the sulfur-containing fossil fuels. And sulfur can also get released into the ecosystem from the um, acid mine drainage. So for these acid mines, they are mainly composed of the pyrite. So pyrite is a compound that's containing iron and uh, sulfur. And these iron uh, and these pyrite can get oxidized to form sulfur dioxide, right? And if it's happening in the water, it's going to form these sulfate lines. And further, they can get delivered or get carried by the water system into our ecosystem. So here is a quick quiz. We know that there are denitrification and uh, nitrification. So what are they being used? What uh, nutrient cycle are they being used? And as you recall, they should be coming from the nitrogen cycles, right? And describes, basically describes the reaction that converts the ammonia into nitrate and also the, uh, uh, the reaction of these nitrates back into the uh, nitrogen, into the atmosphere, right? Okay, so finally, last uh, definition or last process we want to learn is the population dynamics. So let's say if there are limited nutrients in a system, and then we decide to grow some bacteria, okay? And this can happen to any animals, okay? Let's say if there are uh, certain limited quantity of the food in any system, then their population, the population of this living organism is going to follow a certain trend there. It's going to first go through this lag phase. So for the first uh, period of time, the population is going to increase a uh, little by little, right? And then and they're going to go through this uh, accelerated growth phase where they realize that there is unlimited, almost unlimited uh, food resources or energy resources. And then the population is going to go through this uh, log growth phase where the, com the population grows uh, logarithmically. And as the population uh, exploded, so finally, uh, or then they're going to go to this stationary phase where the population is limited, limited by the amount of the energy existing in the system. So finally, as more population, um, there are more population that cannot uh, consume or are not able to be fed by the energy in the system, they will finally go through this death phase where the population drops down. Um, 
uh, almost exponentially. Okay, so for this class, I want to review the major questions. So, what is the ecosystem? Right? How do human beings impact the ecosystem? And also, what are the phototrophs, chemotrophs, autotrophs, and heterotrophs? And also, which one produced organic matter from the inorganic carbon? As we can see, they should be the um, autotrophs, right, or the photoautotrophs. And also, we want to learn what are aerobic, anaerobic, and facultative bacteria. What are the difference between uh, or among bioconcentration, bioaccumulation, and biomagnification? What is the solubility pump and biological pump, and why did car carbon dioxide concentration in the uh, increased increased in the past century? Okay, what are the nitrification are and the denitrification? What does the phosphorus in the surface water come from? We know that they can both come from the um, fertilizers by human and also coming from the uh, wearing of the rock. Okay, the rock are going to release these phosphate into the water. And also want to know what is uh, where does the most sulfur come from? Okay, so that's all for this class.